Hello, and welcome to the second webinar for the Home Visiting Needs Assessment Exploration and Planning Tool presented by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services Early Childhood Home Visiting Unit and MPHI. As we discussed in the introductory webinar, the Exploration and Planning Tool is used across communities in Michigan to identify home visiting needs and capacity to expand home visiting services. This is a second in a series of webinars that are designed to introduce communities to each step of the process. By the end of this webinar, you will have the information you need to complete step two, which involves gathering community input to inform your assessment. While engaging parents as partners in the exploration and planning process is required, this specific step is optional. We do highly encourage communities to engage in this step because it will allow you to hear from a broader group of families about their experiences with home visiting and other services in your communities. This webinar is recorded so that you can view it and share it as needed. However, the team at MPHI is available to answer any questions that arise. To ask a question during or after this webinar, you can use the box just below the video. Let's begin. Today we will cover four topics. First, I will prompt your team to have a quick check-in about step one of this process. Second, I will describe the steps necessary to complete the second step, which will involve conducting focus groups within your community. At the end of today's webinar, I will prompt you to have a team discussion to kick off planning for this component and then review next steps. First, let's go over where this step of the assessment fits within the exploration and planning process. As a reminder, here are the six steps of the exploration and planning process. The process begins with engaging home visiting system partners, including and especially families. Having completed that step, you are now beginning step two, gathering community input. This step involves convening families who have received home visiting and learning about their experiences. After this step, you will move to step three and review population data to assess community risk. In steps four and five, you will explore the reach and quality of home visiting and other services for families in your community. Finally, in step six, you will explore community readiness to expand home visiting. Before we jump into step two, we encourage you to now pause this webinar and take about 10 minutes to check in as a team or individually. Consider these reflection questions and identify what you've learned so far. What came out of step one for you? Now that your team is on board, you are ready to jump into step two of this process, gathering community input. This step offers communities an opportunity to convene families served by home visiting programs and learn from their wisdom and experiences. The purpose of this step is to explore families' experiences with home visiting. Families will be engaged through one or more focus groups. These focus groups will discuss several topics, including the strengths of home visiting, opportunities to improve home visiting, risks facing families and community assets, and what families identify as the most important outcomes of home visiting. It is essential to incorporate perspectives of families into this and any assessment process. In fact, families will be engaged as partners through every step as part of the group you convened in step one. However, this step brings special attention to the experiences of families, expands the number of families giving direct input, and highlights opportunities to improve the home visiting system from the perspective of those we serve. In the next section of the webinar, I am going to offer an orientation to focus group methods as well as the responsibilities of focus group facilitators and note takers. A focus group is defined as a group of interacting individuals having some common interest or characteristics brought together by a moderator who uses the group and its interaction as a way to gain information about a specific or focused issue. For some additional background, focus groups are a qualitative method often used in research, evaluation, and assessment. Focus groups are used to gather in-depth information. They use open-ended questions to generate discussion and deep exploration, and they tend to be organized around a specific topic. Typically, focus groups include a small group of six to 10 people. This creates greater comfort and ensures everyone has a chance to speak. At time, focus group organizers will receive more RSVPs than they have spaces in their group. In this situation, it is preferable to form two separate smaller groups than to convene a single larger group. 
Focus group participants are typically recruited based on defined characteristics. Since focus groups emphasize both participant comfort and familiarity with the topic, as well as exploring a diversity of perspectives, participants must be recruited intentionally. It is important to allow sufficient time for a focus group to explore a topic without creating too much burden for participants. 60 to 90 minutes tends to work well for most topics and groups. In order to make sure focus groups cover the topic fully without going over time, it is important to organize the discussion around a discussion guide. However, it is also important that the focus group facilitator is prepared to ask follow-up questions, probe into specific topics, and follow interesting lines of conversation. The facilitator also must be prepared to bring the group back to the discussion questions when needed. Focus group notes or the transcript of the group is the starting point for analysis. Focus group analysis involves reviewing the group discussion to identify major themes and important ideas. There are two key roles to fill when planning a focus group, the facilitator and the note taker. First, we will go over the responsibilities of a facilitator. Focus group facilitators create a safe space for participants. They welcome participants to the group, encourage dialogue and open feedback, and put participants at ease. Focus group facilitators set the stage by sharing and following group agreements or discussion guidelines that promote respect and inclusion. They also make sure participants know what to expect from the conversation in terms of content, length, and use of the information. As the group begins, focus group facilitators kick off the conversation, ask questions according to the protocol, and probe for more detail where needed. Focus group facilitators seek understanding, so they ask follow-up questions and restate ideas for the sake of clarity. One of a focus group facilitator's most important responsibilities is to make space for different opinions and experiences. Focus groups are not about consensus, but rather uncovering all the different dimensions of people's experiences. So, facilitators ask questions like, does anyone have a different perspective? To draw out different opinions and experiences. Another strategy for creating a safe space and drawing out differences of opinion is remaining neutral. Focus group facilitators use neutral language when they react or ask follow-up questions. For example, rather than saying, that's great, they say, that's interesting, or thank you for raising that point. They also remain neutral in their facial expressions and body language in order to avoid communicating to participants that there are right or wrong answers. Because participants vary in their level of comfort in group interactions, focus group facilitators must be prepared to encourage broad participation, both by drawing out less vocal participants and by encouraging more vocal participants to pass the mic. It is helpful to have strategies in your back pocket to encourage participation without making any participants feel uncomfortable. Facilitators use phrases like, there are a few participants we haven't heard from yet. What thoughts do you have to share on this topic? Or, I know sometimes I need a moment to collect my thoughts before I speak up. Let's give just a moment of quiet so that all group members have an opportunity to contribute, to draw out perspectives. Another strategy for encouraging participation is honoring feedback. While staying neutral, facilitators show respect for each person's perspective with their responses in the moment and by ensuring that they reflect multiple viewpoints when they summarize what they heard, which takes me to the next responsibility. One of the challenging aspects of being a focus group facilitator is checking for understanding. Either between sections of the protocol or at the end of the session, it is important for the facilitator to restate what they heard as the main ideas of the conversation and to ask for feedback. This gives an important opportunity for participants to correct any misunderstandings or add to the conversation. Of course, facilitators are deeply grateful for participants' willingness to share their experiences, and all groups end with a big thank you. High-quality facilitation requires skill building. You likely noted some of these skills as we discussed the responsibilities of facilitators on the prior slide. Facilitators are skilled at rapport building. Rapport, or connections between members of the audience and between you and members of the audience, facilitates comfortable and open communications. It can be critical to getting comprehensive and honest information. Facilitators let participants know that they are the experts on the topic the group is exploring. Facilitators are also ideally familiar with the community and topic, 
such that they are aware of sensitive topics that may come up. Facilitators are also skilled listeners. They use active listening skills to let participants know that they are listening and with great care and that they value the conversation. Active listening involves leaning forward, attending carefully to the words of the participant, and restating what one heard to check for understanding. Listening also includes practicing appropriate silence. Facilitators use silence to give all members of the group time to share. Take advantage of silence to listen for cues that someone wants to talk. Another critical skill for focus group facilitators is neutrality. Facilitators want to create space for all ideas, so they must avoid leading participants into answers by responding to them in ways that suggest agreement or disagreement. Facilitators respond using neutral statements like, thank you for that contribution, or that's interesting, rather than good idea, or that's right. They are also mindful of body language and facial expression. Facilitators are also flexible. Honest and open conversations don't always flow in a prescriptive way. Participants may veer off track a bit, or you may find them answering questions out of order. Facilitators let the conversation flow organically to show participants that you respect their engagement. This can require skipping around on the protocol and checking to make sure everything has been covered. It also requires developing strategies to respectfully and naturally pull the group back on topic when needed. Finally, time management is a critical skill for facilitators to develop. The goal for a focus group is to cover each of these topics and ideally the questions on the protocol. Focus group facilitators are mindful to meter their time by aiming for a set amount of time for each question. This involves helping the team move on when one section of the protocol is taking more time than planned. Phrases like, thank you for all your important contributions, let's move on to our next question, can be helpful. It is important to note that each of these skills takes an extra level of intentionality when focus groups are being conducted virtually. The cues we use in an in-person setting to show listening or build rapport are less obvious through a computer screen, so it can be extra important to be mindful of filling in some of those gaps through our words and engagement with our webcam. As you can see, new facilitators have a lot to keep in mind and several skills to learn. Here are a few tips to make the learning process a bit smoother. If you're nervous or uncertain, stick to the script. The focus group protocol includes all the information you really need. When we get nervous, we can think ahead and jump in before participants are done speaking. Try to stay in the moment and avoid interrupting. Focus group participants have a lot to process, so be sure to ask just one question at a time. If participants seem unclear about the question, repeat it and simplify it if needed. Silence can feel uncomfortable, but in a focus group, it's a tool that gives participants space to think and to put their thoughts into words. Show that you're confident in their wisdom by giving them space to think and form a response. Often the deeper or more nuanced responses can come in the second or third round of responses. So give a pause or ask a follow-up question before moving on from a question. We want all participants to have space to respond. Finally, be sure to stay impartial. If you offer your own perspective, you can have a significant impact on the group discussion, encouraging some responses and discouraging others. Let's move on and explore the responsibilities of a focus group note taker. This role is absolutely critical because focus group data lives in the notes. Note takers capture notes about the group discussion they use the words of participants in their notes as much as possible because restating people's ideas can change the meaning. They also pause the conversation when needed to ask clarifying questions. This ensures that the notes are accurate and clear. Note takers also do their best to note the reactions of the group or emotions that come up during discussion. Ideally, the note taker is supported by an audio recorder. Recordings can be used to create an exact transcript of the session or they can be used to return to any content that was missed or to clarify notes. The note taker is responsible for managing the recorder, which begins by asking the group for permission to record the group and letting the group know how the recording will be used and stored. The note taker also finds a position for the recorder in the room that will allow it to pick up all voices. 
The note taker also waits until the introductions are complete to start the recording. This helps to prevent capturing identifying information on the recording. Recordings can also be used for virtual groups. Many web-based meeting platforms include a recording feature. Alternatively, a recorder can be set near the note taker's computer speaker to capture the conversation. Either way, it is still important to first ask permission to make a recording. Note takers can help the facilitator keep track of time by giving prompts during the conversation and giving a warning when time is running short. A 10 minute, five minute, and three minute warning can be helpful, especially if the group is talkative. One of the most important tasks of the note taker takes place after the group wraps up. Note takers review and clean up their notes as soon as possible after the discussion ends, while the content is still fresh. The memory fades fast, so capturing the information as soon as possible is critical. Ideally, focus group participants receive an incentive as a thank you for their time and expertise. Note takers can take the lead on distributing those incentives, and if a sign-in is needed, they can manage that process as well. Note taking also requires a strong set of skills. First, note takers are good listeners. They must be able to document the conversation as accurately as possible, so they must be attentive to both words and subtext. Note takers ideally capture the exact words of participants, but they also have to be listening for meaning in case they need to summarize what they heard. Note takers also find comfort in asking for clarification if they heard something they weren't able to capture. Second, note takers are fast recorders. While they don't have to be the most accurate writer or typist, they have to be able to follow the pace of conversation while documenting it. Perfect penmanship or spelling aren't important, but what matters most is that the note taker is able to jot down or type down enough of the words and ideas to be able to create an accurate record of the conversation. Third, note takers are precise. They try to retain as much of the wording they hear as possible. As noted, rephrasing can lead to a different meaning at the data analysis phase. Note takers make sure they have scheduled time right after their session to add details that they couldn't capture in the moment but can still recall. Note taking can also be an intimidating responsibility at first. Here are a few tips to keep in mind as you get started. Prepare a note taking template that includes each question in the focus group protocol and space to keep notes. This helps you follow along with the conversation, know what's coming next, and keep your notes organized in the moment. Use abbreviations to keep pace with the conversation. They can be cleaned up after the fact, but avoiding spelling out long words, phrases, or names can help a lot in the moment. When taking focus group notes, you can put spelling to the side. It's simple to fix spelling after the fact, so don't worry about it in the moment. We've noted this last point a few times because it's really important. While you don't want to worry about having tidy notes during the session, you will want to return to your notes as soon as possible after the session to clean them up. The memory fades faster than you might expect. When adapting note taking to a virtual space, note takers have some extra resources on hand. The recording can be used to revisit not only words, but visual cues like head nods. Additionally, the chat box can be used to capture and record thoughts that aren't shared out loud. If you prepare in advance to use these features, they can be helpful in accurately capturing the feedback you received. Now, you might have been in a focus group or other type of group conversation where the facilitator ran into a tricky situation. This slide reviews some of the most common focus group challenges and offers suggestions for how to handle them. For example, you might find yourself in a situation where certain individuals are dominating the conversation. You might try reminding the group of ground rules. Or you might try saying, can I hear from some voices who haven't shared yet? Kind of the flip side of this is if no one responds to your question. Try waiting a bit longer and sitting in the silence. Repeat the question and then rephrase as a last resort. You might find that the conversation is way off track. In this case, try taking advantage of a pause to thank them for the conversation and remind them of the amount of time remaining. Then recenter everyone by reminding them of the last question you posed or moving on to the next. Another situation you might find yourself in is that people are having side conversations. Try reminding them of the ground rules. Ask those who are having side conversations to rejoin the group and share their thoughts. Finally, you might find that participants can't seem to get past a particular topic, 
If you need to move on, try saying, I've heard that blank is an issue. What are some other things we should note? Or try confirming with your scribe that they captured the information and then say, great, what are some other things we should note? Having some of these phrases in your back pocket can help you navigate situations like these. Let's transition to a discussion of the process and protocol you will use to complete step two of the exploration and planning tool. In this section, we will provide suggestions for setting up your focus group, we will go over the protocol, and we will describe the process for analyzing and sharing your findings. Your planning process will begin by selecting a facilitator and note taker. These individuals do not have to be experienced, but consider the skills described in the section above when selecting these individuals. Make sure your facilitator and note taker listen to this full webinar in preparation for the focus group. Next, you will select a date and time. Participant availability and convenience should be prioritized when selecting a date and time, as well as the schedules of your facilitator and note taker. You will also identify a location at this point. Given the COVID-19 pandemic, it may be necessary to go virtual. If you are able to meet in person, follow agency, state, and federal guidelines, prioritizing safety of your staff and participants. Participants in the focus group should include families with children who are five or younger, who are or were enrolled in evidence-based home visiting. In order to hear diverse perspectives, include families from different models, as well as families with varied backgrounds. In order to ensure the group is not too large, limit in-person groups to eight to 10 individuals and virtual focus groups to six to eight individuals. Use an invitation method that works for the families you hope to engage. For example, rather than sending out a formal invitation through the mail, it might feel more welcoming to families to be invited through a phone call or text message from a trusted person. If you are leading the exploration and planning process for more than one county, it will be important to be mindful of which community perspective or perspectives are reflected in your group or groups. Reach out to your coach if you need support thinking through this aspect of the process for your counties. I referenced the idea of virtual focus groups a few times during our presentation today. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, you may need to conduct focus groups virtually for the safety of staff and participants. Fortunately, web-based video conferencing platforms make virtual focus groups possible. If you go in this direction, consider the following tips, some of which we mentioned above. First, choose a platform that participants can access for free that includes video capabilities, and that can be accessed easily via phone, tablet, or computer without creating an account. When you create the meeting, be sure to set a password for security purposes if your platform gives you that option. If you need support selecting a platform, please check in with your exploration and planning coach. Second, check in with your participants to troubleshoot issues related to reliable internet connections, webcams, and other tech issues. In some cases, you may be able to provide suggestions, guidance, or concrete support to navigate tech challenges with your participants. Third, every platform has unique features that you want participants to be comfortable accessing and using. Be sure to communicate platform-specific instructions beforehand, including how to turn on and off the camera and microphone, and how participants can blur their backgrounds if desired. Fourth, offer guidance to participants regarding online meeting etiquette. Ask them to find a quiet and private space, if possible, to mute if not speaking, and to be mindful about using their camera to create connection and engagement. Finally, consider what supports might be needed to make sure the focus group goes smoothly. You might invite participants to join the meeting early to work through issues or host a practice session to give participants a chance to test out their systems and make sure everything works properly. Virtual focus groups face some unique challenges we don't see in person. This slide reviews some of the most common virtual focus group challenges and offers suggestions for how to handle them. For example, participants might be unfamiliar with the technology you're using. Try offering a pre-focus group training session focused on the platform, or begin the session with a tour of the features of the platform and offer a chance to practice. You might find that web connections for some participants are too weak to support video participation. Although it's less than ideal, you can offer a call-in method for these cases. You might find that noise and feedback is distracting. You can try having participants practice using their mute button before the session starts and to ask participants to mute unless they're speaking. Or you can use the host's mute or unmute power to manage the sound. Sometimes you might find that participants are distracted in virtual focus groups. 
You can try asking participants to close out of email or other applications as you start the meeting, acknowledging that it can be challenging to stay focused during virtual meetings. Now you might be thinking, wow, this is a lot to manage. You can assign roles for platform management between the facilitator and note taker in advance and get some practice in, or you can consider recruiting a third person who is responsible only for managing the technology. Remember, practicing using your online platform in advance of the session makes all the difference. Let's review some best practices for conducting focus groups regardless of format. We suggest over-recruiting by a couple of people. It is often the case that not all participants can make the focus group, and over-recruiting can help ensure the group doesn't end up being too small. Host discussions at times when families are most likely to be available. This might require hosting the group in the evening or over the weekend. If at all possible, compensate participants for their time. This is a respectful practice that honors the wisdom offered by focus group participants. A gift card of $20 to $30 is appropriate for a 60-minute focus group. Consider other barriers to participation and reduce them if possible. Offering childcare and supporting transportation are especially important. Offering a meal can also be helpful. After the initial invitation, it can help to send reminders leading up to the date of the event. Families lead busy lives and a focus group can easily be forgotten. Finally, be sure to test your equipment beforehand. If you are using a web-based platform, make sure you are familiar with its features and can do some basic troubleshooting. For example, you'll want to know how to mute and unmute participants, turn cameras off, and use features like screen share. At this point, we will dive right into the Home Visiting Needs Assessment Families Focus Group Guide. The guide can be found in REDCap attached to Step 2. If you have any difficulty finding or downloading it, reach out to your exploration and planning coach. There are two versions of the guide, one for in-person groups and a second for virtual groups. Both guides begin with a welcome and introductions, a review of consent language, and an overview of the purpose of the group and the ground rules. Read through the language before the group to get comfortable with the content. You don't need to read the language word for word, but do make sure you cover each of the ideas. It is especially important that participants know that their participation is voluntary, which means that they can choose to stop participating at any time or decline to answer any questions. They should also be aware that their confidentiality will be protected by the team and that they should also protect one another's confidentiality. These groups are designed to last no more than one hour, and that should be stated up front, along with the purpose of gathering this information and how it will be used. Take the time to go through group guidelines at this point as well. The guidelines set the stage for the group and they give the facilitator a tool to use if needed during the session. Be sure to answer any questions before you jump in and take a pause to check in on the recording. This part of the protocol should take 10 minutes to complete. The focus group questions begin on page two of the document. Questions are divided into four main sections. The first section should take about 15 minutes and focuses on identifying strengths of home visiting programs as well as opportunities to improve. These questions move between asking participants to share their own experiences and asking participants to reflect on families in general. Both question types are included to generate broader discussion. By the end of this section, you want to have a sense of what participants think is really great about home visiting in the community and what they think could make home visiting better. Don't forget to pause or probe during this first section. Participants are often hesitant to share critical feedback early on, so extra prompts might be needed. The second section should take about 15 minutes as well. During this section, you will dive into various dimensions of the accessibility of home visiting in the community. You will explore if families think enough home visiting is available, if home visitors are responsive and available when needed, if home visitors adapt services to the needs and culture of the families in the community, and if home visiting programs themselves are adaptable. By the end of this section, you want to have a sense of the factors that support sustained engagement with home visiting and the barriers that make engagement less likely. The third section should take about 10 minutes. This section dives into what it looks like to access other services that families need in their community. The first question focuses on basic needs for services in general, and the second question dives into services for substance use, depression, and domestic violence. These are difficult topics, and it will be important for the facilitator to carefully attend to the reaction of the group and modify follow-up questions based on their observations. Because the setting is not confidential, emphasize asking about what home visiting programs do well and what they could do better, rather than individual experiences. 
The last set of questions is about the outcomes of home visiting. This section should take about five minutes. This section should give you a good idea of what families think is most impactful about the home visiting experience. Remember, after each set of questions, the facilitator should pause to summarize what they heard and to ask for any corrections or additional input. The group will conclude with a few final questions to wrap up the session. Before thanking the group and saying goodbye, the facilitator should remind participants of next steps and how the information will be used. Your final step involves making meaning out of what you heard during the focus group. This begins with creating a final set of notes or a transcript of the group. As we described before, immediately after the session, the note taker should review and update their notes. If you made a recording, you might want to revisit sections of the conversation to fill in gaps. The note taker should share their notes with the facilitator to fill in any lingering gaps. Importantly, the notes should not include any reference to identifying information about the participants. This goes beyond names to include other pieces of information that could identify a participant. Once the notes are finalized and de-identified, they should be saved and shared with a broader team. Next, you will review the notes and get familiar with them as a team. The team can include your full group identified in step one or a subset of partners. Once the team is identified, each member should read through the focus group notes. Each team member should separately identify key takeaway messages and then come together as a full group for discussion and reflection. Finally, the team will summarize findings, including strengths of home visiting in the community, opportunities to improve home visiting, outcomes of home visiting, and other key takeaways. Once complete, you can enter your findings online in the same REDCap form you used for step one. You will upload your notes in REDCap along with your key takeaways in terms of strengths, opportunities to improve, outcomes, and other findings. Let's take a look at REDCap now. Once you've logged into the system and selected the home visiting project and the county you wish to enter data for, you will find the Step 2 Gather Community Input form in the same place you found Step 1. In the Step 2 form, you can enter your focus group data into the text fields provided and upload files as prompted. Don't forget to save when complete. And remember, you can save your notes and return at any time throughout the process. Let's take a moment to apply these steps to our own teams. At this point, we encourage you to pause the webinar and take about 30 minutes to get familiar with the focus group protocol. Identify one group member to read out loud each section of the protocol. Take turns in this role. After each section, pause and discuss. What did you notice? What will take practice? What will you want to prepare for? What questions do you have about the process? Finally, let's review what the next few weeks will entail. You can start conducting focus groups as soon as you're ready. Then enter your findings into the online tool in REDCap. Reach out to your coach as questions arise and update your timeline for the rest of the process. And once you're ready, please watch the next webinar on assessing community risk. As you continue in this process, you will have questions and needs. We are here to help. Reach out to the MDHHS and MPHI team anytime for support. We're committed to learning as much as we can about need and capacity to expand home visiting across our state, and we're committed to your success.